Welcome to the Look Good, Move Well podcast. Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to the Look Good, Move Well podcast. You are going to hear a different approach to the episode today. Unfortunately, my beloved co-host Satya is out sick today. And because I'm traveling next week, we needed to get some content filmed and recorded. So I am doing this solo. I shouldn't say that solo. We got Nate Nate on the camera. He's still here. Um, FBB banter is going to be very different without a uh, uh, somebody in the hot seat next to me. So I am going to keep that to a minimum. What I will say is that we, as a team, Nate, Satya, and myself, just got back from Sweden. We took a trip out there for <clears throat> about 10 days, and we had an opportunity to coach and interact with people from all over the Nordic countries and Europe, and it was a real pleasure. Um, and I'm going to the topic, the FBB banter topic is, what was the best thing that you ate on the trip? And we had a culinary uh, experience, unlike I was expecting while we were there. It was uh, it was actually m one of the best surprises of the entire trip is we went there to coach fitness and uh, see some new places, and we got to eat some incredible food. But on the last night in Stockholm, we went to a restaurant, and uh, some of you who've followed me for some time know that I'm a huge Anthony Bourdain fan, and Anthony Bourdain was like as close to a, a hero of mine as I could uh, ever imagine, um, somebody who dramatically impacted my life through his uh, book, Kitchen Confidential, through his shows, television tr programs, No Reservation, The Cook's Tour, and then more recently, Parts Unknown. Um, I followed his career and his travels around the world. As a matter of fact, I traveled all over Southeast Asia and other parts of the world um, to places that he had been to and places that he had frequented uh, for different food, local cuisines. Matter of fact, I hit about 22 locations in Southeast Asia that he had been to specifically when I was in my early 20s. Anyhow, it shaped my life. So when I go to a new city, and this is a pro tip, if you like Anthony Bourdain or even if you don't, he had a, a knack for finding places that were truly local and really expressed the local culture, the local cuisine. So if you love food and you travel, there's pretty good chance that wherever you're at on the on the face of the earth, he had been to in some capacity. So when we were in Stockholm, I googled Anthony Bourdain Stockholm and of course the uh, sort of the show notes of his time spent in these places is there. And now most people have actually you know, listed out the restaurants that he has been to, the specific dishes that he had been, he ordered when he was there. And there was a restaurant that he had been to in Stockholm that did traditional Swedish dishes. And we went and I got the pork knuckle. And it was, uh, it was phenomenal. And it was one of the best things I had on the entire trip. But it was made the best thing I had on the entire trip because it was a tribute to my love of Anthony Bourdain, knowing that he had been in that same dining room, eating that same thing, prepared the same way. Um, so it's a great way to finish out the trip. And then we got on a plane the next day and came back and here we are. So I'm filming, recording this a few days after, less than a week after we had that d dining experience. It was memorable. Um, and Nate <clears throat> had uh, also had some memorable food that night. We got to share with a bunch of people. It was uh, really terrific. So that's FBB banter. I hope you enjoyed that. If you go to Stockholm, Pelican restaurant, Pelican, P-E-L-I-K-A-N. That's the one you got to go to. Okay, on to the topic of today, which is going to be based in nutrition. We have put out emails, YouTube content, so editorial, YouTube, and we have a nutrition challenge that's coming up soon. And the recent content was based around the question, when should you be counting your carbohydrates? And this is a question I get frequently. And as a matter of fact, I put something up on social media just today. Hey, what questions do you have for me about nutrition? I'm going to be on the podcast today. A lot of the questions were around carbohydrates. Um, so what we're trying to do is clear some carb confusion. And 
I have a history of coaching nutrition and also experimenting with nutrition for, as many of you know, a couple decades. The coaching part of it has been for at least a dozen years or more. Um, if you count kind of the loose education and coaching that I did with, you know, friends and family before I kind of made it my profession, all of my history in coaching, you know, nutrition and the mistakes that I have made my, myself and with clients and, and the successes that I've had have led me to a particular style of coaching. Um, what I want to talk about today is sort of like the step-by-step -step process that I believe people should take when they approach nutrition. And when we get to the part where it's, this is where you start counting your carbohydrates, hopefully you will see and you will hear from me that that is less of a priority than many other things that are really highly prioritized in my approach to coaching nutrition. And when I work on my own nutrition after a period of, you know, experimentation, where I want to get back to basics, this is what I focus on. Um, and again, that's informed by years and years of failures, successes, um, and, and just working with people. Now, if you listen to another nutrition coach, they might have a different system that works for them. And look, at the end of the day, you can get to success, whether it be weight loss, muscle gain, performance improvements, a number of different ways with nutrition. And at this, at this uh, sort of the center of this debate about which system works the best and which system is, you know, correct, there are kind of two main concepts that are, are at the center point of all of these different approaches to nutrition. That is basically, is it a quantity debate or approach or a quality debate and approach? What do I mean by that? Well, people talk about, hey, you, when, when it comes to nutrition, coaching, and dieting, it's all about the numbers. It's all about how much you eat. If you, if you, there's nothing else that matters. Calories are everything. Calories in versus calories out. If you want to gain muscle, you got to get more calories in than you're expending. If you want to lose body fat or body weight, you got to burn more calories than you're actually eating. You got to be in a deficit. So you got your camp of quantity people. And then you got your camp of quality people. Hey, you got to be eating whole foods. You got to be eating organic. You got to be, don't eat processed stuff. Don't eat packaged foods. Um, stick to, to real, you know, things that in themselves are ingredients. Um, you know, something that was local and that you had direct connection to is of higher quality than something that was processed in a different country, sent on a plane to you, blah, blah, blah. Who's right? Is it the quantity group or the quality group? And my, my stance is that they're both right. You cannot ignore one side of the equation or the other. If you want to lose <clears throat> body fat or if you want to gain muscle, <clears throat> you're going to have to optimize and uh, work on the quantity side of things without question. Calories do matter. But then on the other side of the table, the quality side, well, <clears throat> people talk about, well, all calories are the same. Yes, to a certain degree, but where I get my calories from might have a pretty significant impact on me, my health, my digestive health specifically, and more importantly, my ability to stay consistent with my quantity goals. What do I mean by that? You got to lose body fat. You're going to be in a deficit for a while. You need to maintain that deficit for a considerable amount of time for that body fat to come off. Anybody can starve themselves for a couple days. <laughs> can you eat in a caloric deficit for a month? Well, you better develop some good routines, habits, and consistencies. If I eat, and this is just an example, this isn't a personal anecdote, but let's say I'm a person who wants to lose body fat. Hey, if I eat... Um, ground beef, rice, um, and broccoli. If I eat those three things, I'm really happy, I'm satisfied, and I can maintain my caloric deficit for a long time. But if I eat burritos in the same amount of calories, well, for a few days I'm good, but I really have a hard time controlling my appetite when I eat burritos. I really like to overeat them. They're so, like 
pleasurable to my palate that I just can't control myself very well. So in that, in that case, it's not the calories per se that are, are affecting you. It's the quality of the food. It's the food choices where you can do fine on 2,200 calories a day for a month if you eat these types of foods because they're more satiating. They're, they fill up your stomach more. They, right, they, they actually work with your physiology to keep you in a deficit and your mental state. Versus if I eat the same 2,200 calories of burritos or, I don't know, pick your pick your poison, something that's really sweet, really tasty, like, you know, McDonald's cheeseburger and fries, if you're into that kind of thing. Okay, 2,200 calories of cheeseburgers and fries. I can't stop at 2,200 calories. It really makes me want to eat more. I have a hard time staying full. So the quality of the food in that case is what's impacting your ability to stay consistent with your quantity. So quantity and quality both matter. You cannot, I believe it's, it's not one or the other. It's a combination. So where do you start? Well, this is where different coaches will have different, you know, approaches. Somebody's going to say, I don't care what you eat, just track everything that you're eating. Okay. That's more of a quantity approach. Somebody might say, Hey, don't worry about tracking anything. I want you to just change these things. That's more of a quality first approach. <clears throat> and the way I'm going to set up these stages, these steps that I believe you should go through, the reason I think that these stages and steps work, one, through practice, but two, logically, the way I've set these up is that if you change the first couple steps, it's the minimal amount of buy-in and work. It's, it's, it's the easiest thing to do, and it, could ha and, it, and it does and can have a dramatic impact such that if you just follow steps one and two, you might actually get to your desired body weight or your desired body and develop this great relationship with food and never have to go to steps three, four, five, and six, you know, and beyond, which are a little bit more detailed, require a bit more attention and a bit more work. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into it. I'm going to lay out some of these steps and then I'm going to go to my phone and I'm going to pull up some of the questions that I got today and try and answer some specific questions from the audience. Let's do it. So starting, number one, <clears throat> improve your food choices and quality. This is step number one. I want you to, as best you can, start to remove processed foods, and I'll talk about what that means, and inject more real foods, more ingredients, uh, meaning like the food that you're eating itself is an ingredient. It's like a banana is an ingredient. Banana chips that are in a bag have oftentimes bananas, maybe some added sugar, maybe fried in some oil, also with some salt and some other spices, maybe some added flavors to make them more appealing. So you take the same thing, a banana, but you put it in two different forms. One is processed with many ingredients versus a banana that is an ingredient. The banana itself, higher quality by the way I'm defining it. So if you got <clears throat> higher quality foods in your in your, at your meals, you're prioritizing as much local, fresh, when you can, organic, grass-fed. Those are going to be the foods that I want you to base the majority of your meals around. So it's like, okay, is that, if that's step number one, I'm not asking you to like take anything out of your diets, so to speak. Like You don't have to categorically take an entire food group out. You can still eat the stuff that you like, but every opportunity that you have, aim for whole foods. Rather than buying the taco that is prepared by somebody else that has lots of ingredients that you're not aware of, make the taco yourself. Get a corn tortilla, which is just masa and water. <laughs> Get some meat, brown it up in a pan, put the meat in the tortilla, take a couple slices of avocado, put that in there. And then put some cabbage or some pickled, you know, veg or some lettuce on there that you like. That's a four ingredient taco, tortilla, meat, avocado, and a veg versus what you might get at a, some, somebody making it for you where it might have added sugar in, in it to make it sweeter, might have a bunch of extra spices that we don't know how, which one is actually impacting your ability to digest it well. 
They might have added fats that they're cooking with that are cheap and low quality. We don't know, so opt for whole ingredients whenever possible. So that becomes your main mission. And I'm not saying that that's easy, but I'm saying that with that, you're not having to count anything yet. You're not having to weigh anything yet. I haven't told you to stop eating something, like take that out. And for those reasons, I think that's the best and first place to start. Now, if when do you move on to the next step? Well, if you're doing that nine times out of 10, so you're batting 90% on this, then I think, and, and so you're batting nine out of 10 and you're like, hey, and I'm ready to take the next step with my nutrition, I want more, then you would move on to the next step. If you're doing that nine times out of 10, you might see a dramatic change in your body to the point where you're like, hey, I'm good. I don't need to go further than this. That, thanks, Marcus. That was the best tip I'd ever like learned. I'm actually being measurable, but measurable about this. And I see that every nine, nine out of 10 meals, I am preparing myself. And something that we've talked about in the past on the podcast, we've had challenges for this. This is where a five ingredient meal becomes a really valuable thing. And a five ingredient meal is where there's five ingredients on the plate. <laughs> That's it. So the taco I mentioned was four ingredients. So if you were going to have a five ingredient meal, you might make a plate full of tacos that each has, you know, that's four ingredients right there. And then maybe you have a piece of fruit or, or, you know, one other thing with it, if you would like, and that's your meal. What it does is it simplifies, it removes most processed stuff, and it helps raise the quality of your food by keeping it simple. Okay, now we're going to go on to step two. You've gotten step one down. Now step two. This is where we're going to introduce something we call food hygiene and hydration. So another reason people fail when it comes to dieting or changing their behaviors around nutrition isn't always because of what they're, you know, consuming. It's oftentimes how they're consuming it. So they eat the right thing, but they have lost all touch an awareness with how their body responds to food and what fills them up and what leaves them hungry. And that can look like somebody who eats really fast, somebody who eats in front of a television and is distracted with how they're, you know, with what's going on in front of them. Somebody who's on their phone messaging while they're supposed to be, you know, while they're eating their lunch um, or in the car on the way to an appointment, trying to shovel something down, while you're while you're in a rush somewhere so this is food hygiene the the food hygiene concept is how you consume your food how it gets from plate to mouth into your digestive system we are designed our our excuse me not our design just our our biochemistry our biology our how our nervous system works is that we have different nervous system states uh, that control the you know, autonomic portion of our nervous system. We have something called sympathetic and parasympathetic. And many of you know that as fight or flight and rest and digest. And there's a state that we want to be in to optimize digestion. That's why it's called rest and digest. Well, to get into a parasympathetic nervous system state, we have to kind of look at how we're interacting with the environment around us. And this idea of being on technology and being engaged in stuff and really, you know, trying to be on the go, that does not set us up well for digestion. And when people are rushing through their meals and they're in this sympathetic state, they might finish, you know, 600 calories worth of food, but they finished it so fast and they weren't in this restful state that they immediately are thinking, I'm hungry again. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And they had plenty of nourishment to fill them up and satiate them, but they got done so fast that those signals haven't hit their brain yet. And so they go and consume more calories. So they're over consuming as a result of eating too quickly. So this is where we coach again, practices, best practices, sit down when you, when you eat a meal, don't be standing up, chew your food more thoroughly before you swallow. You know, some people say 20, 30 bites per every, 30 chews per every bite of food. Um, turn your distractions off, your phone off, turn the TV off, you know, get outside, like get some fresh air, take your meal outside at, at break time, at lunchtime. Those are really important steps to helping us have more awareness of how our body feels and whether we're actually hungry or we need more food and 
whether we are connecting with the meal in front of us. On the same topic of awareness and like, am I hungry or am I not? One key thing, and I added into step two is hydration. One key thing people miss is not drinking enough water or thinking about hydration. At the end of the day, our bodies want a certain amount of water, a certain amount of fluid. And if we're not giving ourselves enough fluid, we're going to get signals to our brain that say we are thirsty. Those thirst signals can easily be confused for hunger signals. And guess what? When you eat food, there's water inside of food. So you're hydrating yourself with food. But oftentimes we don't need more calories. We just need the water inside the food because we haven't hydrated enough. So by making sure you're getting adequate amounts of water every single day, you can really help yourself have a better appetite control and ultimately control your caloric consumption to the point that you want and is optimal for you. For hydration, I say a very good rule of thumb is take your body weight in pounds, divide it by two, and that's how many ounces of water you're going to have today. So 200 pounds individual, take that, divide by two, 100, that's 100 ounces a day. All right. That's 12 glasses of water <laughs> or 12 cups of water, eight ounce cups of water, which, you know, is six tall cups of water or three, you know, large bottles. You can figure it out. Okay, you've done step one, nine out of 10 times. You've done step two, nine out of 10 meals or nine out of 10 days. Do you still love what you, do you love what you see in the mirror? Do you want more? Maybe you stop at stage two or maybe you wanna move on to stage three. Okay, so moving on to stage three, this is where we get into our first discussion of quantity. All right, we've done quality, we've done hygiene, and now we're going to do quantity, but we're only going to start with the simplest and most important nutrient in the diet when it comes to quantity, and that is protein. Step three is all about protein quantity, getting adequate, sufficient amounts of protein. We're starting to hear health professionals who have long been guided by a recommendation that is far too low for protein, daily, daily required protein or adequate protein. We're starting to hear health professionals say, hey, you know what? I think we, it was too, it's been too low. I think we need to increase the amount of protein. Well, guess who's been doing that for years? The fitness community. We have been saying, get this amount of protein, which is far above the medical recommendation as a daily requirement. But as is the case with many things in the health and fitness world and the medical world is that, you know, people are out practicing things that are anecdotally working really well for them. And then this catches up slower in the, you know, scientific literature and the medical papers. But so where to start? How much protein is enough? And we, I'm, I'm of the mindset that we're going to give the number, follow me on this one. You're going to take your body weight in pounds and you're going to multiply it by either 1 or 0.8. So 0.8 to 1 grams of protein per pound of body weight. You're going to have to do the calculation, the conversion to kilos if you're doing this in kilograms, but 0.8 to 1. People say, okay, should that be my current weight or the weight that I want to get to? Well, depends. The, real, the reality is that you're not going to get into trouble eating too much protein. It's, it's, I don't want to say it's impossible. It certainly is possible. And I'm not here to challenge you to go do it, but to overeat protein consistently long enough that it could cause some type of damage or adverse reaction to your body, you would have to eat a lot of protein, a lot of protein. And the reason that's hard to do is because protein is very satiating and it, it, it's possible to do it on one day or maybe two, but to do it day in and day out for months on end, you know, long enough to create some damage, it's going to be super challenging and expensive for many people. So I think that number, the 0.8 to 1, is a great ballpark. And if you're, let's say, a little bit overweight from where you want to be, you're heavier than you want to be, and you choose to do one gram per pound of your current body weight, that just means you're going to have to eat more protein every day, which is not problematic. It just might be challenging for you. So it all comes back to like, what is realistic in your day? Is eating 200 grams of protein realistic for you because you're 200 pounds and you want to get down to 170? Then go for it. If it's not, if you're like, man, that's a struggle, then choose the lower 
choose the goal weight, which is 170, and go with that. That's still a, tr- a struggle. Then choose the goal weight and go with the 0.8 number. And so you're now down at like 140 grams of protein a day. Know that getting a little bit more protein is likely going to have positive impacts on your muscle synthesis, on your appetite control, on your energy, etc. Okay, so that's where we're at, step three. And I promise you, if you've done step one, two, and three, and you do it consistently and I hate the word religiously, but you know the the term, then you are in you're you're approaching the top percent of all people that that diet. Like you're gonna have results. Okay. And I'm talking nine out of ten times. I'm not saying it's easy to do those things. I'm just saying that if you do them, you're winning. So high quality, sitting down and chewing every meal, limiting distractions, uh, drinking enough water, and eating your body weight in grams of protein a day, man, you're, you're doing excellent. And again, I haven't told you to stop eating anything. I haven't told you to cut out anything, right? If you want to eat ice cream, okay, then make it or get the most minimally processed, the highest quality ice cream you can get but not at the exclusion of your protein, not at the exclusion of sitting down and eating your meals and making sure that the other nine meals that you had, you know, the last three days were of highest quality and not, you know, uh, a processed, uh, you know, dessert. Okay. So if you're at those end, end of those three things, you're probably having some success, but maybe you want to take it a step further. Where do I go from there, Marcus? All right. Step number four. This is where we get into another quantity thing, but it's not so detailed. This is, you got three meals a day, let's say. I want you to have one to three servings of fruits and vegetables at every meal. That's it. I don't care which one it is. There is no better better or worse. I just want it to be a real piece of fruit or vegetable. No, not beet chips that you got at the store that were fried, you know, in some vegetable oil, you know, no, not the banana chips that I mentioned, you know, not potato chips. Like I know I'm saying a bunch of chip options, but I just don't want it to be a process. I want it to like, go get a potato, cut it up and eat it. Go get an avocado, get a banana, pineapple, broccoli, spinach, whatever you like, whatever feels good to you. And a serving is different for every fruit and vegetable, but just look up what is a serving of banana? You know, okay, it's half a banana, half a medium banana is a serving. Great. I had a whole banana. That means I had two servings. I'm, I'm set, I'm set for this meal. Okay. So there we go. That's the next simple step. And by doing that, by adding in fruits and vegetables, you're going to increase your overall nutrient intake, micronutrient intake. Uh, you're going to get some, uh, fiber in your diet. You're going to get low calorie uh, dense foods that are going to fill you up as opposed to, you know, like you could eat a bag of banana chips or a banana and feel equally full, but the banana chips have three times the number of calories. So again, this is a way of rounding out your meals on top of the protein, on top of the good food hygiene, and on top of the good quality. Now you've got fruits and vegetables on your plate, three meals a day, four meals a day, however many. Okay, now where are you at? Are you satisfied with your goal, with with your body? Are you satisfied with where you're at? Are you doing this nine times out of 10? You know, I see that these steps that I've laid out are far easier than getting on a phone, tracking every calorie, tracking every food, tracking every macronutrient that you put in your body. That is a lot more demanding of your time and energy and mental focus than what I've already laid out. And so that's why we haven't gotten there yet. But again, if you're at stage four, you've done all the steps, you're doing it consistently, and you still want to take it another step, okay, time to take it another step. And this is where we get to actually counting everything that goes into your body. Step five. If you have steps one through four done, then when you get to step five, it's going to be that much more powerful. Because you already built a ton of awareness, you already did the most important thing with quantity, which is protein. You're already getting the foods that your body knows how to digest the best, which is unprocessed and minimally processed real ingredients. You're drinking enough water and you're spreading out your, your carbohydrate intake through fruits and vegetables already. 
So we got those out of the way and now we're on to step five and you basically have to just count everything that goes into your body. You don't have to actually know what you should be eating. And this is where step five is important and not a macro prescription. Step five is just gain some more awareness of numbers. So use a tracking app for seven days and track everything that goes in. Seven days is the minimum. A month is ideal. What happens after you've tracked everything that you eat and drink for seven days and a month? While still following steps one through four, you learn a ton about your body. You learn a ton about quantity. You learn a ton about calories and macronutrients. You raise a tremendous amount of awareness of like, oh man, like I didn't realize, but that piece of fruit has way more sh like carbs or sugar in it than this piece of fruit. It's double the calories and they both make me feel the same in terms of fullness. So maybe I'll go with the, if I'm trying to lose weight, maybe I want to go with the one that has less calories. Like you learn those things by actually tracking. It's remarkable how much or how little people are aware of that when they've never done any paid any attention to the numbers that are in their food. So step five is just tracking everything without trying to hit specific goals. The only thing that you're trying to hit specifically is how much protein are you have in each day and those fruits and vegetables at each meal. Okay. So then the next stage, instead of just tracking without a specific goal, the next stage, and this is stage six would be, I'm going to set a specific goal. And I'm going to have a calorie goal that I'm going to hit as well as a protein goal and then a carb and a, and a fat goal. And this is where it gets a little bit um, more detailed. And this is why you got to put in the, the work up front to build those habits and build the consistency in the other stages before you're really at stage six. And to do stage six correctly or successfully, you're going to want to go find a calculator that is going to help guide you to the right amount of calories to hit your goal. This is where the functional bodybuilding macro calculator comes in. The FBB macro calculator, which is linked in the show notes, the description, wherever you're seeing this, this is the link that sends you to our site where you can input your body metrics and the goal that you have, fat loss, muscle gain, recomposition, whatever it might be. You can say, what level of protein you want to have? Is it the one gram per pound of body weight or is it the 0.8? And you can kind of generally say, hey, this is how many carbs, this is what I want to do from a carb fat perspective. I recommend that you go in, put in your metrics, put in your goal, choose the high, car high protein as a starting point. That's the one gram per pound of body weight. And then choose moderate carbohydrates because it's going to ask you what kind of, how do you want to deal with carbs? You want to do low carb, high carb, moderate carb, carb cycle, choose moderate because that's just going to be the most simple, basic, easy way to do it. And the macro calculator will spit out your numbers. These are the calories that you want to try and hit every day to hit your goal of body recomposition. This is how much protein you're going to have. And then it's going to give you some carb and fat goals to hit too. And so now you're going to continue to track, but instead of just tracking, you're going to try and manipulate your meals to try and hit these numbers. That's, that's, that's hugely challenging. It's one thing to just write it all down and see what the numbers look like. It's another thing to create a meal to hit the numbers that you have been told to hit. But you're at that stage. You're at stage number six. You want to take it the extra step. You're going the extra mile. So it's going to be harder. And this is what I want to really share with this stage one through six is like, as we get to stage six and stage seven, which comes the final stage, it's very challenging, but it's doable and anybody can do it. But if you start from zero and you go right to stage six, there's a high, high likelihood of failure. There's a high likelihood that you're going to not be able to complete it for 30 days, which would be your target time frame to follow something like this. Okay, great. So you just did it. You set a goal. You chose moderate carbs, high protein. Uh, you put in your metrics. You, you're gonna, it's going to give you all that information right on our website. It's going to email it to you directly with added nutrition and training eBooks. Um, so get over there and do that if you haven't done it already, even just to get some information from us. But now you're like, okay, great. I'm, <laughs> if you're, if you hit stage six and you've been doing all the stages, you're now in the top one, 
you know, 0.001% of people dieting, okay? You likely have abs. You likely look great. You're crushing it. You're, you know, strong. You feel energetic. You're sleeping great. Like, all these things are probably happening already. And you might want more. Now you're like, okay, now I want to get really nuanced. I want to get experimental. I want to try something. I heard this thing about low carb. I heard this thing about carb cycling. I want to try and put on some muscle now, so I'm going to change my goal in the macro calculator. This is where you've earned the right to go and start to play because there's no best approach. There's no like low carb or high, you know, or low fat. None of these are the best approach. It's like what works for you. And the fact that we did everything else up, you know, up to now has helped you learn for yourself intuitively what is working best for you. So I started this by saying, when do you start to count ca carbs? <laughs> well, stage one, two, three, and four did not count a single carb. Stage five had you tracking how many carbs you had, but stage six was where we actually gave you a carb prescription and you're now counting how many you're having. And it's stage six and seven where you're gonna start to think, okay, how many should I have? Is there another way that's more optimal for me? Maybe I wanna try low carb for a while and see how I feel. Maybe I want to try high carb. Maybe I want to try this carb cycling thing where it's low some days and high another day. You're finding that stuff out much later. So what I like about this is that you now have the answer to when should I count carbs? Not at the first day. That's not important. They're, all the other things matter more. And ultimately, if you're getting enough protein of high quality and you're hitting your calorie goals, then you're going to see the results that you want almost always where carbs come in is do I function better with high carbs or low carbs is higher carb easier for me to stick to my protein and calorie numbers or is low carb easier for me to stick to it and that's that's a reality for some people when they're low carb they're able to stay in a calorie deficit much easier because when they eat more carbs it impacts their appetite okay that's perfectly fine but there's no magic secret sauce to being low carb or high carb. There is absolutely 100% no reason to think that, hey, if I eat low carb, I'm going to lose fat. No, you can overeat on fat easily. Okay. So those are the stages one through seven. And I'm going to take a couple more minutes here. Uh, of course, I welcome questions from you anytime. You guys can shoot them to me in DMs. But I have these questions that I got from uh, Instagram. And I took a screenshot of a few of them, so I'm just going to blitz through them here, okay? Marcus, do you eat more carbs around training? What about off days? My, my feeling is this. On training days and off days, I like to stay at the same number of calories and the same amount of energy every single day. I don't, uh, even when I'm not training on a day, I'm not training, I'm still burning energy, and my body is still healing from the day before. I like to know what my average energy expenditure is seven days a week and that's what i try and hit with my calories so on a heavy exercise day i might be under eating but then on a rest day i might be overeating and it all balances itself out consistency of calories just makes it easier to stay on the plan for longer as far as eating more carbs around training there is some evidence and support of the fact that when we train and specifically intensely that this opens up glute transporters on the muscle tissue so active trained muscle that has just done a workout is more receptive to soaking soaking up carbohydrates into them you might want to take advantage of this but at the end of the day if your calories are right if your protein is right you know doesn't matter if i had my carbs for breakfast right after training or you know at dinner that it's it's generally going to be of the same net impact there's some benefit to getting that those carbohydrates after training, but in the grand scheme, it's not hugely important. Does protein quality matter? And how does protein differ? I believe protein quality does matter. If you buy organic, if you buy grass fed, look, protein generally, and certainly um, in many sources, is coming from animal products. Yes, there's protein in plant based uh, uh, foods as well, but I think any place that you're getting your protein from you want to aim for the highest quality because especially if it's meat foods higher up the uh, you know animals higher up the food chain they accumulate more toxins because they're alive longer before they you know become your 
lunch um, before they're slaughtered for, for a meal. And when they're consuming a lot of pesticides or things that are not organic, they just accumulate those toxins. So if you can get grass fed and if you can get organic chicken, beef, pork, whatever, then I think that that's optimal and I think it's worth the investment. If I'm at a caloric deficit and I'm working out four to five days a week, will carbs make me chubby? This is I'm word for word, okay? This is what I just read. So as we've heard me say today, if you're in a caloric deficit, then you're not going to get chubby. That's the first thing. If you're truly in a caloric deficit, your body's not going to store body fat. Um, so whether you're having carbs or not isn't the, the big impact. Carbs might be helping you train harder, which is good because that increases your energy expenditure, makes your training impact much, you know, much more impactful. Um, you get a better response and maybe you retain more muscle and that's awesome. If your carbs are making you overeat, then that could be a problem. But as you said, you're in a caloric deficit. The term, infl <clears throat> excuse me, the term inflammatory and being inflamed due to foods, how can you tell if you are? All right, well, inflammation happening from food starts at the level of the digestive system. So that's how inflammation from food happens. Food goes in and it kind of irritates the digestive system. So what are the things that tell us that we're having digestive inflammation? Farting, burping, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, uh, these, uh, you know, general gas, these are sort of your signs. So look at your poop, listen to your farts, <laughs> listen if you're burping a lot, you know, if you feel bloated and uncomfortable, again, these are signs that you're having inf inflammation due to your food. Would you say that consuming a large amount of protein is hard on the liver and the kidneys? I wanted to address this because I talked about having high protein and that being something that we coach in the early stages. Um, the evidence is just really uh, doesn't support this. It's if you have healthy kidneys to begin with, then the amount of protein you would need to consume to create an adverse effect is extremely high. So it's not something that you need to be super concerned with. Now, if you have damaged kidneys or you have kidney uh, disease, then this is something you should definitely talk to your healthcare professional about um, before making any high, high protein diet dietary changes. Can cutting carbs during the week for a refeed meal one time a week inhibit weight loss? Okay, this is a big thing that people do is I'm in a calorie deficit all week and then the weekend comes and I have my cheat meal and they want to know, is this totally throwing off my goals? This is an, a game of averages. If your average for the whole week is three, two to 300 calories a deficit, so every single day you're 400 calories in a deficit, and then you have one day where you're 1,000 calories over, how does that change the net effect at the end of the week? So no. If, and by the way, cutting carbs during the week is just one way to, to restrict calories. You could, you could restrict calories another way during the week. It doesn't matter. So it's carbs are not the main thing here. But you have to just really be mindful. How much are you blowing it out on your one, you know, refeed day or cheat meal a day? And does that one refeed day turn into a whole weekend of refeeding? And again, that can be the big thing that impacts people's ability to have results is that they overdo it. And the average over the course of the week is that they're in maintenance and they never lose any weight. Okay, and then the last one. How can I ease myself into not tracking macros after doing it diligently for years? And I wanted to end with this one because it really ties together everything I've talked about today, which is if you dive into the um, counting of things too early and too diligently and you become too wedded to just the numbers then you missed the point of stages one through four, which is to develop great habits that are totally uh, um, separate from the, quant the quantity game. Because you can get to your results by being diligent about quantity, regardless of quality. You can, there's a whole movement called if it fits your macros and people are having a lot of external success. They're changing their bodies, they're feeling good because they just eat whatever they want, but they just make sure it fits their macros. 
And those people get very attached to those numbers and they don't know how to get out of those numbers ever in their life because they don't know how to prioritize quality, good food, hygiene, hydration, protein, and fresh fruits and vegetables. So my advice to that person who's asking is to go back to stage one and look, th look at stage one through four and start to really own those things nine times out of 10. And if they wanted to ease back on the counting, then focus on the things that I discussed as being the most important. One, have a calorie goal and hit your protein. Don't worry about carbs and fat. Okay. And then after a while, you can start to ease off counting calories and just focus on quality and protein. And you can go all the way back to the earlier stages of the progression that I showed and use that to help guide you to something that feels sustainable for the long, time, long term, get you the body you want, the performance you want, the mental clarity and focus that you love or that you need so you can more enjoy life and worry less about the numbers ongoing. This was a very unique episode today. I did not have my, my trusty sidekick uh, or partner. Sidekick sounds like, I don't know if that sounds good. Satya is way more than a sidekick. I miss her. She'll be back next time. Um, again, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Shoot me some messages. How did this episode treat you? And um, thanks for joining. I'll see you next time. Yeah.